Let me start. Thank you all for coming. Uh, could, could you please raise your hand if you are able to solve this puzzle? No, nobody. Okay. So, uh, and could, could you please raise your hand if you tried to do this? Okay, not, not so many. Okay, which is cool because I will show you how to implement a, an extremely simple program uh, for solving this puzzle, and this will uh, uh, this will be a program for solving the satisfiability problem. So let me start by. Uh, by motivating the problem. So, first of all, it is extremely important problem in theoretical computer science in particular. So, if you prove that it can be solved or it cannot be solved efficiently, uh, and by saying efficiently, we usually mean in polynomial time, then you get a price of $1 million. Okay? Uh, the second reason to study this problem is that it has a million of practical applications. So, many problems like scheduling, planning, verification, in many practically important problems are easily reduced to SAT, and I will try to show you how it is done in practice, okay? And the third reason is that it also has many connections in, in theory. So many, uh, so many areas actually involve using satisfiability problem, and some of these areas are proof complexity, like formal verification, fine-grained reductions. And I, I will show you a little bit of, uh, of each of these three areas. Okay? So, yeah, by the way, please do interrupt me at any point if, if you have a question. Uh, so, this is how the problem is, is stated, so I introduce it on a toy example. So, in this case, we have five so-called clauses. Uh, each of them is just like a sequence of, of numbers, right? Some of them are negated. And the question is to select uh, one integer from every clause with, with a single restriction. You are not allowed to select uh, x together with minus x. So, for example, we can try to select minus 2 from the first clause, then minus 2 from the, third, uh, from the second clause, minus 3 from the third clause, minus 1 from the fourth clause, and then we cannot select anything from the last clause because we already selected minus 1, minus 2, and minus 3. Okay? So, at least this particular choice of, of, uh, of science for, for 1, 2, and 3 doesn't work. Okay, it does not satisfy this formula. Okay, let me show you just some other attempt. So we can select one from here, three from here, minus two from here, and minus two from here, but then we are not able to satisfy this clause. Okay, so for this toy example, it is actually not possible to satisfy all five clauses. Okay, it is not immediate and it should not be immediate, but, but still. So this is a toy example. Uh, let me. Let me now further motivate this problem. So first of all, there is a section on this problem on satisfiability in the fourth volume of The Art of Computer Programming by Donald Knuth. And what is interesting is that this is just the longest uh, section in The Art of Computer Programming. And Knuth in particular states that the reason why it is the longest is that it is a killer application, and this is in turn because many problems reduce to SAT easily. Okay, now there is uh, like a, th a thick book devoted solely to satisfiability problems, so it is over 1,000 pages, like 30, 34 chapters. Uh, and let me also show you some quotes. Uh, all the quotes are by Turing Award recipients, which is more or less Nobel Prize in, in computer science. Uh, the first one is by Edmund Clark, who is like, so to say, the inventor of model checking, of like the main method in verification. The second one is by Donald Knut, who is the author of, uh, of The Art of Computer Programming, and who is like the living legend in computer science. And the last one is by Steve Cook, who actually introduced the theory of NP completeness and who proved that like many years ago, something like 50 years ago, that SAT is uh, the hardest one. Okay, uh, okay. Uh, some more resources devoted to the SAT problem. So first of all, there is an annual international conference devoted solely to, to this problem. So by the way, you probably don't know another computational problem for which there is a conference devoted uh, to this single problem. 
Okay? Uh, there is also a competition of, of programs for solving this problem. They are called SAT solvers, uh, and it is held already, already for, for 20 years. And finally, there is a scientific journal where papers uh, on SAT are published. Okay? Uh, Another interesting aspect is that in recent years, we, we've seen some mathematical results proved by SAT solvers. So this is not just a program for, like, for solving puzzles or for, for proving things about verification or scheduling. There are mathematical facts that were first proved using SAT solvers. Uh, and uh, probably it is difficult to read here, but uh, in this particular case, the proof produced by SAT solvers is of size roughly 200 terabytes. Okay, this is huge, and it is debatable whether it can be considered as a mathematical proof or not, but still, so this is a proof, it can be mechanically checked, it is huge, it cannot be checked by hand, but it can be checked automatically. Okay, so this is one such example, and this is another example, which is like probably two years ago. What is interesting is that uh, the corresponding conjecture that was proved by, by SAT solver is actually from, so to say, continuous mathematics. It is from geometry. And it was stated, it was first reduced to some problem in discrete mathematics about finding a huge click in a huge graph, and then this problem was, was solved using SAT solvers. Okay, and so my guess is that we will see many such result, uh, results in, in, in forthcoming years. Okay, so this is an outline for the talk. So I will start by showing you how to use SAT solvers. In, so in particular, my goal is to, to show that it is extremely easy to use SAT solvers in practice. Uh, I will then tell you a few words uh, about the algorithms used by, by the state-of-the-art SAT solvers. I will then proceed to theory and I will show you why do we call SAT uh, the hardest among all computational problems. And then I will show you how SAT is used in formal verification, for example. Okay? Uh, mm, solving puzzles using SAT solvers. Uh, so the three puzzles that I'm going to, to, to solve using SAT solvers are the following. So it is Sudoku, probably a well-known puzzle, right? It is also n queens puzzle where you have a, an n by n chessboard and your, your goal is to place n, uh, n queens that do not attack each other. And the last one is diagonals. Uh, this is uh, the puzzle that you've seen on the title slide. Uh, what we're going to do to solve them using SAT solvers is an example of the so-called declarative programming. Basically, we are going to just state the rules of these puzzles in terms of SAT, uh, and we are not going to bother about algorithms for solving these, uh, these, these puzzles. So we are going to use SAT solvers as a black box. So we state the rules of the game, and then we invoke a SAT solver as a black box. And the state-of-the-art SAT solvers are so efficient that they will be able to solve all these puzzles in, in the blink of an eye. Uh, okay, so this is how you, uh, this is how you give an input to, to a SAT solver. So uh, I'm going to show you some examples in, in Python. In, uh, most of the SAT solvers are implemented in C or C++. However, there are Python wrappings for, for some SAT solvers, and this is one of them. Uh, so you just import this module, then you represent your formula just as a list of, of lists. So this is our set of clauses that we've already seen. And then you just invoke the solve method. So if you just try to, uh, to check the satisfiability of these five clauses, then it produces some SAT. Okay, this second call actually solves uh, all clauses except for the first one, right? And in this case, uh, this formula is unsat and the solver is, is satisfiable, I'm sorry, and, uh, and this is its satisfying assignment. So if we consider uh, one, two, three with plus signs, then it basically intersects every clause except for, for the first one. Okay, this is, this is an interface for working with, uh, with a SAT solver. 
Uh, let me show you how to solve Sudoku. So this is this particular example is uh, in the internet. It is known as one of the most hardest Sudoku Sudoku puzzles. I mean, this particular instance is one of the most hardest. Uh, uh, I will run the corresponding code on my computer, and you will see that the SAT solver finds a solution immediately. In fact, it is possible to implement a solution, uh, to implement an algorithm solving Sudoku puzzle by hand. But what will be nice about, about our approach is that we are not going to implement any algorithm. We will just state uh, these rules of the game in terms of clauses, and then we will invoke a SAT solver. Okay, so let's let's do this. So first of all, we need to so a SAT solver works with clauses, and clauses consist of so to say Boolean variables. And we are going to introduce the following variables. So for every row R, for every column C, and for every digit D, uh, where R, C, and D range from one to nine, we are going to introduce a variable X R C D. And it will be equal to one if and only if we are going to put digit D into the corresponding cell of the table. Okay, so these are just very natural, uh, natural Boolean variables. Uh, so the first thing we need to do is to somehow transform these three indices into a single index, right? Because our variables are indexed from one, two, three, and so on. So we are not allowed in it. So the interface of SAT solvers is so simple that the, the variables are indexed from starting from one. But in our case, since every each of these three parameters is just a digit from one to nine, we just convert it into a single digit as follows. So we just concatenate them, so to say, and we get a number from, from zero to, to 999, right? So this is just converting three indices into one index. Okay, so I will be using this variable, uh, this this method for for using variables when stating clauses. Okay, now another uh, another function that I will uh, that I will need to use is the following. So given some set of of variables called literals in my case, I would like to say that at least one of them is is positive, or at least one of them is true. Uh, so, for example, if I have variables one, two, three, so to, st uh, to state that at least one of them uh, should have the, um, oh, I'm, I'm sorry, yeah, uh, it should be not at most one, it should be exactly one of, okay, so there is a typo in the, in the title of the slide. So given three variables, I would like to state that exactly one of them should be positive. Okay, and this is the right title is here in, in the Python method. And, and this is how we write it. So we, first we write that at least one of them should be positive. And for this we write a clause consisting of all positive literals, right? And to state that no two of them uh, should be positive, we just, for every pair of different variables, we state a clause consisting of two negative literals, right? So if you uh, if you write for three variables, if you write such four clauses, this will mean that exactly one of them should have positive sign. Okay, and this is how it is done. So I first write a clause consisting of, of all the literals, then I iterate uh, through every pair of, of literals, and for all of them, uh, for every such pair, I, I introduce a clause consisting of two negative literals. Okay, so please do interrupt me if, if, if anything is unclear here in the code or, or, or in the explanation. So when we have this method, then we basically do the following. So first of all, we write down the following constraint. We, we write down that in, in, every, in every cell, uh, we should have exactly one digit. Okay, so for, uh, then we iterate uh, for every row and for every column, uh, which range from one to nine, we state that uh, this, this particular cell contains exactly one of, of the nine possible digits. Okay, then for every, uh, for every row and for every digit, we also write uh, a constraint uh, that 
says that this row uh, should contain this digit exactly once. Okay, it is not so important how it is done exactly in Python, but we definitely need to write this. Then we do the same for, for every digit and every column. And finally, the, the last piece is that for every, for every three by three block, we need to state that every digit appears exactly one in this block. So we do this as follows. So we iterate through uh, uh, for every, uh, what do I call it? For every kind of bottom left corner of every three by three block, we, we state that it must, the corresponding block must contain exactly one occurrence of each, of each digit. Okay, and then finally, so note that before, uh, before this point, what I was telling is, uh, what I was trying to, to tell the SAT solver is uh, some general rules of the game uh, of Sudoku, but I, I haven't actually used uh, any, any of these particular digits, right? So it is only on the last stage that I'm going to introduce them and let me, let me show you how it is done. So this is given a puzzle, I first check that, well, there are two asserts, not so important. Then I state that uh, there should be exactly one digit in every cell, one digit in every, each digit should appear one, exactly once in every row, in every column, in every three by three block. And then finally, uh, I actually implement, uh, I state that uh, if in my input puzzle there is a particular digit, then I state that the corresponding variable should be true, so to say, and for this I introduce a clause which consists of just, uh, of just one variable. And in this case, this variable should be true. Uh, now, let me probably well, and this is, let me probably skip it. This is just for printing the, the output. Let me just better show you on, on my, uh, in the EDE. So I'm going now to, to run the code and uh, in my, on, on my laptop in the EDE. And right after this, I will show you some more compact code uh, which solves uh, the, other two, the other two puzzles, namely the Queen's puzzle and the Diagonal's puzzle. So before I switch to the EDE, could you please let me know whether there are any questions? Uh -huh. I have a question. Uh, all this code introduced uh, just the iterational method. You just went through rows, columns. Right, right. right? Is there the, some optimal way, the fastest way to solve this? Um. Yeah, this, this is a good question. Thank you. So, what, so in general, there are many ways to reduce a problem to, to SAT. And uh, in my code, I was not, not trying to optimize anything. So sometimes you might want to optimize the number of clauses, or you might want to, to optimize the number of variables. But what is true in general is that even if you, uh, if, even if you are able to use a smaller number of clauses, this does not guarantee uh, that the running time of, uh, of a SAT solver on your instance is going to be smaller. So this is usually, you usually do this um, by experimenting with, with your reduction. Um, okay, so are there, uh, are there any other questions? So if not, let me, let me then try to, to run the code. Okay, so this is, uh, so are you able to, to read it? Well, okay, so pr probably not so important, but this is just, this is just the same code in, uh, in the editor. And this is how, how I, I specify the puzzle. So this is exactly the puzzle that, that we've seen on the slides. And then if, uh, if, we, now, if we now run it, so it, it produces the result immediately if uh, I hope you, you were able to see this. So this, this is the result. And this, is, this happens for, like, for, for this so-called the most difficult uh, Sudoku puzzle. This is how I Googled this. So uh, it was called the most difficult Sudoku puzzle by some professor from Finland. I'm, 
I'm not completely sure how do you measure the, the difficulty of Sudoku puzzle, but you can try to solve it by hand at least and, and see that this is not so easy. Now, let me probably show you two, two other examples of uh, So, for example, let me show you how, how you could solve the Queen's puzzle uh, uh, let, let me just remind you that in the in the Queen's puzzle uh, we have a chessboard, so it is it can be a classical chessboard of size n by eight by eight. It can be as well an n by n chessboard, and you would like to put n queens such that they do not attack each other. Okay, and this is how you can solve it. And in this case, the, the, the code is much more compact because I use a slightly different, uh, a slightly different module which provides you with some uh, high-level methods that do something for you. And let me just try to explain you what is going on here. So here I, uh, I just specify that I have an eight by eight, uh, eight by eight board and uh, then in the next initialization stage, we do the following. So the pool is actually is something like a hash table of variable indices. Okay, so instead of converting triples into, into single integers, I'm going to use hash table which basically uh, checks, uh, which, which basically takes any hashable objects and, and gives you and gives you an idea of the of this object. And closes is just like a, a list of closes that I'm going to populate. And then what I'm going to say is that in every row uh, I need to have exactly one exactly one queen. Okay, and for this I just use the so-called cardinality encoding, and I uh, I I just take all the variables from this row and I state that the number should be equal to one. Okay, then I do the same for every, for every column and then I do the same for every, for every diagonal and to, to iterate through all diagonals I do the following. I specify uh, a cell in my table and then I consider two diagonals going through this cell. One diagonal going from like top right to, to bottom left uh, and the other one symmetric one and this is what is going on here. So I state that on every diagonal there should be at most one uh, uh, there should be at most one queen. So once again, here I'm saying that in every row there is exactly one one column and in every column, uh, exactly one queen, I'm sorry, in every column there is exactly one queen. And here I say that in every diagonal there is at most one queen. Okay? So once again, we are basically telling the solver the rules of the game. Then I just invoke the SAT solver, I solve it, I get a satisfying assignment, and then what, uh, what you cannot see on the bottom is just like unwinding this model to print the solution. Let me once again show you that if we, if we run it, it produces a solution immediately. So here you can see, well, I just mark by capital X uh, all, all the queens. So it is probably not so easy to verify it by uh, just by looking at this example, but at least we see that indeed in every row there is exactly one queen. And you can actually check that there is no diagonal where you have more than, more than one queen. And you can basically play with this code and I will give you a link. Uh, you can just increase the number of, uh, of, uh, of of queens that you are looking for, and it also produces a result immediately. And in some cases, if you increase, for example, the number of queens to 100, then the running time of this reduction to SAT is, uh, is larger than the running time of the SAT solver. Okay, so uh, f finally, let me show you how you can use, mm, how you can solve how you can solve the diagonals. Okay, so for diagonals, it is probably even, even shorter. So you basically say that you have a five by five grid, you would like to, pay, uh, to place 16 diagonals, then 
then what I do is uh, I introduce a variable for every possible diagonal. And then for every two diagonals that intersect each other, I append a clause uh, of length two saying that uh, they cannot appear simultaneously. So I just uh, put the, the two corresponding variables with a minus sign. And finally, I, I state a clause that I would like the sum of all my, uh, of all my variables to be at least the number of diagonals. And this is in, in this case, it is 16. So once again, if you run it, uh, uh, it produces, it says that the resulting formula is satisfiable, but I, uh, I haven't implemented the printing the result. So if you are interested, please do run the code yourself and, and you will find the solution to the, to the original puzzle. Uh, it is one of these puzzles where finding the solution by hand is not so easy. So you can invest, I, I don't know, probably one uh, or uh, a few more hours for this. And then please, if, if you fail, please run this code. Please parse the, the corresponding satisfying assignment uh, and you will see that it is indeed possible. Okay, now let me, let me tell you a few words about the, the algorithms used used inside these SAT solvers. So there are basically two techniques. So the first one, which is probably the most popular, is called backtracking. So what you are doing backtracking, you, you assign your variables one by one. And if you, if you encounter a conflict, you just backtrack, you go back. So this is just a recursive approach. There is also a local search approach. And most of the, most of the state of the art SAT solvers are based on backtracking. Another popular approach is, is called local search. And here you do the following. You start with some assignment to your variables. If it satisfies your formula, then you are happy, you are done, so you just return. Uh, otherwise, you just try to, uh, to fix your assignment a little bit so that it satisfies all the clauses. So uh, solvers based on local search approach are known as incomplete solvers. So there are two types of solvers. So some of them are complete uh, and they're based on backtracking technique uh, and they're called complete because uh, they have to satisfy the following requirement. If a formula is satisfiable, they should output SAT. If a formula is unsatisfiable, they should output unsat. Uh, incomplete SAT solvers based on local search, they are allowed to output the third value, which is I don't know. So some, because they can start with, a, with some assignment, then they try to fix it. And then if, if they are not able to fix it, to, to turn it to a satisfying assignment, they just stop and tell you that probably it is unsatisfiable, but probably the algorithm was unlucky. Uh, so the second approach, sometimes uh, it has advantages, but once again, most of the SAT solvers are, are based on backtracking. Let me just show you a toy example using our previous formula, how backtracking could look like on this formula. So, so we are trying to satisfy all these five clauses. So let's, let's start with variable one and let's, uh, let's pick it with, with a plus sign. Let's pick it like as a positive literal. Then in this case, this clause is already satisfied, right? So we just remove it. This clause is already satisfied. And from this clause, we just remove minus one because if we select one, we are not allowed to select minus one, right? So after selecting, after assigning the, the positive value to one, we simplify a formula. And this, is, and this is the result. Then we just try to satisfy it further. So we take minus three, for example. But if we take minus three, then this clause becomes empty. It is not satisfied. So in this case, there is an empty clause. And, and this is the point where we backtrack because we, we haven't satisfied this clause. So the empty clause is a clause which is not satisfied, okay? So we backtrack, we try to, instead of minus three, we, we try to select three. And in this case, the formula is simplified to the following because, uh, because this clause is satisfied. From here, we remove minus three. From here, we remove minus three. So we get minus two and two. And this is clearly an unsatisfiable formula, but our solver can still uh, try to discover it uh, on his own. Uh, and then at this point, we backtrack to the previous decision that can be, that can be flipped. So we backtrack here. 
okay? And then we proceed in the same fashion. We go here, and then in every leaf of this recursion tree, we will see an empty clause, which basically proves that this formula is unsatisfiable. And this is exactly what happens in practice uh, with, with the only exception is, there, is that there are many other heuristics implemented inside of SAT solvers. Let me just mention some of them. So first of all, what, what I used to simplify a formula was some very easy, some very simple simpli simplification rules or reduction rules. In practice, there are much more and much more delicate ones. Okay, there is also uh, in SAT solvers, there are many heuristics implementing for selecting the next variable to consider and for selecting the value. Uh, uh, let me tell you once again. So here I somehow, somehow I decided to first branch on, on the variable one and here I decided to branch on variable three and here I started with minus sign and then on plus sign and the, here I started on plus sign and, and then proceeded to minus sign. Uh, so each of these decisions in SAT solvers is controlled by some fine-tuned heuristics, okay? So these heuristics are responsible for this. There is also uh, an extremely important thing called clause learning. So in this case, uh, the, the solver can actually add some clauses to the initial formula. These clauses are usually conflicts. Uh, and when, it, uh, when the SAT solver learns that there is some clause that cannot be satisfied, so uh, it, it actually adds something to the initial formula so, so that it can be useful somewhere in, in the future. Okay? Uh, well, needless to say, uh, SAT, solver, SAT solvers use some efficient indices to, to store all the clauses. Uh, uh, there are some, something like adjacency lists and, and so on. And finally, the state of the art SAT solvers, they are actually, they are in engineered uh, in, well, in an extremely optimized way, so to say. So sometimes they like optimize even the processor cache or, or something. So I'm I'm not an expert in in, in such uh, in such optimizations. But uh, nowadays, implementing your own SAT solvers, which is going to be the state of the art SAT solvers, is an extremely challenging task. But what is interested what is interesting is that in some cases the winners in SAT competitions are implemented by by students, by PhD students, for example. But in any case, uh, it. In order to do this, you need to invest probably a, a few years of uh, uh, of of working on 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 your on your SAT solver. So let me summarize this practical part. So SAT solvers are, are extremely efficient on one hand, and on the other hand, we still don't know whether in theory SAT can be solved faster than in two to the n time. So by n we usually denote the, the number of variables and Two to the n is the running time of a just brute force approach. So you just try all possible assignment and you check whether any of them satisfies your formula. So two to the n is the best upper bound that we know. So th there is a huge gap between theory and practice. So on one hand, in theory, we don't know anything which works faster than just a brute force approach for, for this problem. But in practice, the heuristics used in SAT solvers are so good that many practically important problems are, are solved in less than one second for some reason. So nobody knows how to explain this. Uh, okay, now I'm, I'm going to, to tell you a little bit more about the theory behind the, this problem. Uh, okay, so what is the reason why we call this problem the hardest one? Uh, let me let me introduce a few more problems. So this is the independent set problem. In this case, uh, we are asked to select some number of very some number of nodes in this graph so that no two of them are adjacent. So could you probably tell me how many nodes can you select in this graph? So can you select three or can you select four? Can you select five?
So in general, we are interested in the maximum number of nodes that can be selected so that no two of selected nodes are joined by an edge. So can you select four such nodes? Okay. Three, four, six. Yes. Oh, oh no, six. Seven, yes. <laughs> you cannot take six and seven, but probably you can do something different, yeah. right? Sorry. Ten. Ten. Three, four, six, and ten. Yeah, this, this. Yeah, this works. And uh, okay, let me just tell you right away that it is not possible to select five, uh, five nodes here. And this should not be immediate to you, and the, but I will be able to convince you that it is not possible. Okay, so another famous problem is called knapsack. So here we are given a bunch of numbers, and our goal is to select some subset of them whose sum is equal to, to this uh, strangely looking number. Uh, uh, and then the next question is, even if you are able to select a subset of these numbers whose sum is equal to that one, so can you uh, get it? just uh, can you get the next number also the sum of of some numbers okay so what wha what was important for me to uh, why i introduced this problem is that sat independent set and the knapsack problem they share the following extremely important problem so if somebody gives you a solution to this problem you can easily check that it is indeed a solution to this problem and let me again show you this on, on an example so if i claim that the sum of these uh, six numbers is equal to, to that number then you can easily check this well probably with a calculator or with your smartphone right uh, so also if i just highlight these four Notes you can easily check either by hand or with the help of the machine that indeed there is no edge between them, right? And this shows this difference between verifying a solution and finding a solution. So verifying a solution is easy, but how to find a solution it is not always clear. And this is some fundamental uh, fundamental property which led some 50 years ago to the introduction of this class NP. And this is a class of all problems for which we can easily verify solution. And P is a class of all problems for which we can easily find the solution. Okay? And then the problem uh, which is known as millennium problem. Uh, so it asks whether P is equal to NP or not. And in other words, it asks whether it is true that if we have a problem that we can efficiently verify, does it imply that it can also be efficiently solved? So once again, so it is called a millennium problem. And if you solve this problem, if you prove, for example, that every efficiently verifiable problem is also efficiently solvable, then you prove that P is equal to P and you get $1 million. So, yeah. And are yeah. there problems that are not efficiently verifiable? There are, right. But we are usually not interested in them. So we, we can... <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. So there are some problems that do not belong to class NP. Uh, probably it is, it can be said that NP captures most of the computational problems that we're interested in. But you can, you can come up with some artificial problem. So for example, you take N as an input and then you print N to the N to the N to the N, some huge, huge number. So we are not interested in practicing this problem, but it does not belong to class NP. Mm -hmm because the number is, is huge. But in many cases, in all the problems that you can, uh, uh, that you are interested in, in practice, I don't know, logistics, scheduling, uh, verification, most of them, they belong to the class NP. So they're all easily verifiable. Right, right, exactly. Well, sometimes you need to, to tweak, uh, to tweak uh, this, the problem statement a little bit, but still, so for, uh, so, for example, in logistics, uh, you, you have, say, 10 points and you would like, uh, so imagine that uh, there is a delivery company and there are 10 points on the map and, uh, and some vehicle needs to, to, to visit all these 10 points. And the question is, what is the optimal 
what is the optimal tool along this. Uh, so if we are talking about an optimal, if I give you an optimal solution, it is not so easy how you can check that it is indeed optimal. But you can, instead of asking me uh, what is the optimal solution, you might want to ask me whether there is a solution uh, which is of length at least two kilometers, for example. Then in this case, it is verifiable. Mm -hmm. So uh, by... Uh, just by the, I don't want to give a formal definition of the class NP, but NP consists of yes or no problems. Mm -hmm. And sometimes you need to tweak an optimization problem to turn it into a yes or no problem. Okay, mm -hmm. uh, okay and let me probably show you that it is indeed so. You, you can read about uh, all other Millennium problems uh, on the uh, uh, Clay Mathematical Institute site. Uh, and this is a P versus NP problem. Uh, by clicking on this problem, you will see the pictures of two very famous scientists. So this is Stephen Cook, who is from the US or Canada. And this is uh, Leonid Levin, who was actually in Soviet Union at that time, and now he is in the US. So they basically stated, stated this problem. And once again, by proving that there is an efficient algorithm for every problem in NP, you prove that P is equal to NP, and you get $1 million price. And by proving that there is no such algorithm, you also get $1 million price. Okay, but if you prove that there is such algorithm, and if your algorithm is efficient in practice, then basically there are many, many other consequences besides of one million that you get as a prize because you break all cryptography and, and so on. Uh, and by the way, Donald Knuth that we've mentioned in the beginning believes that P is equal to NP. So most of us, actually most of Mm, like most of the algorithmists, so to say, believe that P is not equal to NP, but Knuth disagrees. So we still don't know where the truth is with, with this. So, okay, I have probably 10 more minutes. Uh, okay, now, uh, now let me try to, to tell you what do we mean when we say that SAT is the most difficult problem. So by saying this, I, I mean the following. So if we have an efficient program that solves every formula, uh, an efficient SAT solver, then we will be able to solve every problem from the class NP. So uh, in a sense, to solve all the problems from the class NP, it is enough to implement an efficient SAT solver. So, and which is, which is impressive because in, in the class NP, we have all kinds of problems. We have logistics, we have some optimization problems, we have this planning, verification, scheduling, everything. And for all of this, it is enough to implement an efficient SAT solver. And this is done as follows. So let me, so this is a theorem by Cook and Levin that every problem from NP reduces to SAT. So this is a non-trivial result, but, but not, not so, I'm not going to prove it, but it is not so difficult. So the, the only problem is that to formally prove it, you need to, to state all the, you need to state the class NP formally, you need to state the computational model formally and so on. But it is when everything, when it is done, proving the theorem is not so difficult. Sure. And when we say reduce, uh, we mean by polynomial time? Right, yeah, so yeah. Isn't that uh, like all of the problems in NP class can be reduced to each other in the polynomial time? Uh, this is true uh, about NP complete problems. So we have, we have class NP, inside of it we have some problems which are called NP complete. So inside the class NP, we also have simple problems. So sorting also belongs to the class NP. That's not true for NP hard problems. Right, right. So NP hard problems are problems for which everything from NP reduces to, but an NP hard problem might lie outside of the class NP. And Mm. Uh, okay, so let me probably skip it, not so important. Uh, let me just show you how also, how you can reduce in the different directions. So how you can reduce SAT, for example, to independent set. So assume that you have, uh, that you have uh, uh, a program that solves the independent set 
problem efficiently. Let me show you that then in this case, you can also solve SAT efficiently. So assume uh, again that we have this toy uh, example that we have five clauses, then you can do the following. So for every clause, you introduce just a bunch of nodes and you basically label them exactly like, uh, like they're labeled in the clause. So these three nodes correspond to this clause, these two nodes correspond to this clause and so on. Then for every bunch of nodes here, you, you connect them by edges. So this is a small click, this is a small click, this is a small click and so on. Then the last step you do the following. Uh, basically, now you would like to select uh, a single node from each of these clicks, right? At the same time, you are not allowed to select, for example, minus two here and two here, right? And just to forbid this, you just join every pair of, of, of opposite literals by an edge, right? So you do the following. So you just introduce a bunch of edges, but this is still okay. I mean, this is still in polynomial time. And then uh, what I claim is that this graph contains a five independent set if and only if this formula is satisfiable. Why is that? Well, just by construction. So if there is a five independent set, let me go back here. So if there is a five independent set, then we know for sure that from each click, we must select exactly one node because in each click, every pair is joined by an edge, right? And on the same at the same time, we connected every pair of uh, of opposite literals by an edge. So we, we know for sure that we are not going to select minus three from here and three from here, right? So if you know how to solve every instance of independent set quickly, then you can also solve SAT. And any other problem reduces to SAT. And, and this is just a nice example of a reduction between problems. Uh, let me also mention that we, it is interesting to note that we've seen this graph before. So if we just relabel the nodes and then we redraw this graph, then this is exactly the graph that I've shown you before. And the reason why there is no independent set of size five is that the formula is unsatisfiable. Okay. Mm. Let me also probably briefly mentioned that there is a highly active area called fine-grained complexity uh, where uh, people started actually to reduce uh, various problems from P uh, to the, to the to the SAT problem, for example, there are many other reductions, but one particularly nice example of such a reduction is the following. So there is this edit distance problem where you are given two strings and you would like to find the minimum number of uh, modifications in the first string to get the second string, right? And by, by modifications, one usually means like deletions or or insertions of symbols, or just when you change the, when you change a symbol. So we all well. Uh, I mean, in most of the algorithms classes, it is taught how to solve it in time n squared. We still don't know whether it can be solved faster. And what was proved less than ten years ago is that if you are able to uh, to improve this n squared at least a little bit, then you will also get an improved running time for for the SAT uh, problem. So by improving uh, this exponent here, you, you improve the base of this exponent here, which can also be read as follows. It is probably easier to solve SAT in less than two to the n time than solve edit distance in, in time less than n squared. And edit distance is also an extremely important computational problem in practice uh, because in computational biology, they have so huge strings, then n squared is completely infeasible running time in practice. Okay, so it is still interesting to understand why don't we have an algorithm solving edit distance in less than n squared time. So there could be two reasons. One of them is that we haven't yet discovered the algorithm. And the second reason is that there is just no such algorithm. And we, we still don't know what is the case. Mm. OK. Um. OK, so I have one more part, but I'm running out of time. 
let me probably stop here and let me just roll to the end of the... So if you have any questions, please do ask. <laughs> so these are some pigeons if... Uh, there is also some very compact code that actually fools uh, fools a SAT solver. So I mentioned previously that SAT solvers are extremely efficient. On the other hand, it is possible to... So by stating this very compact formula, you actually... You get a formula on something like 400 variables on which every state of the art SAT solver works for ages. So just by asking a SAT solver to prove that you cannot put 20 pigeons into 19 holes such that every hole is occupied by at most one pigeon, uh, you make a lot of troubles for, for all of the SAT solvers. So somehow this formula is extremely, is extremely difficult for SAT solvers and we even do know the reasons for this in, in theory. Okay, and, and this is how you can generate this formula uh, just with, with, with a single line of code. So I skipped uh, the last part just because I, I, uh, uh, I provide here a, a link to, to the slides. So if you are interested, please download the slides. And, uh, and please do send me questions if you if you are interested in some of this stuff and please do ask me questions right now. So, okay, my 7.30. Okay, so perfect timing probably. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay, so thank you for, for your attention. Yeah, 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 I do. So I, I do this for, for, for my research. We are also trying to implement our own SAT solver. <laughs> Not, well, it is, formally it is a circuit SAT solver. So it is given not a formula, but a more general structure a circuit. Is there, a, like using an analogy with uh, uh, chess, uh, what's it called, not chess solver, like basically all that play chess, mm -hmm. I think, they had, a, like, basically 10 years ago, the best ones, they were used on heuristics. Right. Uh, and uh, now the best are based on neural networks, I yeah, suppose. Yeah, yeah. So is there, like, the same thing going on with set solvers? Uh, not really. So machine learning methods are, are, are not yet successful in, in SAT solving. So they are trying, but all, all the winners in SAT competitions are still based on heuristics on, so to say, some discrete mathematics ideas. So for, for machine learning, the, there is definitely some research, there are publications, but, well, the truth is that all the winners are not based on machine learning. Well, we'll see probably in five. So uh, in just, just several days ago, there were some news that they used machine learning to, to try to multiply matrices faster. So probably they will use machine learning to, to produce algorithms <laughs> to solve SAT. So matrix multiplication can be reduced to SAT as well. Uh, well, it can, but probably it is an overkill in, <laughs> in, in practice because formally it can be, but, but I've never heard that uh, somebody mul multiplies matrices with the help of SAT solvers. Uh, of you mean of the SAT problem? Yes. No, the, basically this is uh, so. So this is basically the format of uh, of uh, it is the so-called DMAX CNF format that is accepted by all SAT solvers, and it is more or less the formal statement of the SAT problem in practice. So I was trying to simplify it a bit, but so when you state it formally, you state it in terms of like logic, Boolean operations, so conjunctions, disjunctions. Here I decided to use, well, so to say, programming style 
so that I introduce it here exactly like you, you give it to a SAT solver. But this is more or less formal. And this is, this is not a special case of SAT. This is exactly SAT. No, it is not known, it is not expected. So the uh, quantum computers can solve SAT, if I'm not mistaken, in time two to the n divided by two. So it is still exponential. We, in general, we do not expect, well, at least there are no indications why quantum computers can solve NP-complete problem in polynomial time. So quantum computers are, are successful for some problems like factoring, for example, but factoring is not known to be NP-complete. So uh, I'm not at all an expert in, in quantum computers. It, it, it all seems like magic to me still. So I, I, I've been trying to understand this uh, several times, but still I, I'm not completely sure that I get all the details. But yeah, as far as I, as far as I know, I, I also read uh, uh, read the blog by Scott Ernson, which is one of the experts, like world famous experts in quantum computers. If I remember correct, correctly, he, he mentioned that, yes, we don't know where the quantum computer can solve and be complete problems. So quantum computers, if, if physicists build efficient quantum computers, they will break some cryptographic protocols based on, uh, on factoring. But for SAT, uh, it will be safe probably. <laughs> Let me probably show you the last slide because there is this link to the slides and to the code. Mm -hmm. And these nice quotes by Turing Award winners. So are there any, any other questions uh, or statements? Uh, So if not, uh, let me first of all thank you for your attention one more time. And let me also mention that in, in about one month, we will have uh, another talk on, on something completely different, I, I believe. So please, please stay tuned. Cool. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks.